Welcome to this new YouTube channel dedicated to pedagogical explanations of research topics in mathematics. For this first video, I will give you an introduction to puncture Hilbert schemes of the plane. This talk is part of a masterclass given at the conference Topics at the Interface of Low Dimensional Group Actions and Geometric Structures. Here we go! The puncture Hilbert scheme is an interesting mathematical object because it allows different equivalent definitions which link together different areas of mathematics. The most direct way to define it is to use algebraic geometry and to define it as a space of special ideals. You can also define it in a geometric way as the blow up of the symmetric space. Finally, you can also define it purely in terms of linear algebra as a space of pairs of commuting matrices. The main part of this talk consists in describing these three viewpoints and to understand the links which exist between them. To start, consider n points of the plane, the complex plane C2. We want to describe these points as an algebraic variety, which means that we try to describe these points as the intersection of polynomials. Or formulated otherwise, we want to describe these n points as the zero locus of an ideal of polynomials. Let's see how this works when we take n points in a generic position. In that case, there will be a polynomial, a unique polynomial, which is called the Lagrange interpolation polynomial, y equals q of the x, which is of degree n minus 1, and which will interpolate these n points. And then, in order to get exactly the n points, we might use a polynomial which only depends on x, which is given by the product of x minus xi, where the xi are the x coordinates of, of the n points. So with these two curves, which intersect precisely in the endpoints, the ideal is already well defined. So this ideal will have two generators, the product of x minus xi and the polynomial minus y plus q of x. This ideal has a special property. It is of co-dimension n, meaning that when I take the quotient of the polynomial ring in two variables c of x, y, and I divide by the ideal i, I will get a vector space of dimension n. This can be seen easily as follows. This quotient c of x, y divided by i is actually the function space of my algebraic variety. And in my case, these are only n points. So a function on n points is defined by its value on each point. And this is a vector space of dimension n. The set of ideas with this property is already the puncture Hilbert scheme. The precise definition is here. The puncture Hilbert scheme of length n of the plane which will be denoted by hilp n of c2, is the space of ideals of c of x, y, which is of co-dimension n. Let's give some examples. When I take n equals 1, then the quotient has to be a vector space of dimension 1, which is c. So this is a field, so the ideal will be maximal, so it will just be described by a point. So the one-point Hilbert scheme is just c2 itself. Another example is given by the ideal generated by x squared minus 1 and by y equals lambda x for some parameter lambda. Geometrically, this corresponds to the intersection of a line of slope lambda with two vertical lines, giving two distinct points. Now consider the idea given by x squared and y equals lambda x. This is actually the limiting case of the previous example when the two vertical lines collide and gives only the y-axis. So now geometrically, we only see the origin, but still in our ideal, we have some degree of freedom. We still have our parameter lambda. Note that this example lives in the two-point Hilbert scheme. Finally, let us consider the ideal generated by x square, xy, and y square. Geometrically, what you see is just the origin, but when you take the quotient, you will see a vector space of dimension three, because you have a basis given by one, x, and y. So this is an example of an ideal in the three-point Hilbert scheme. To understand the structure of the whole puncture Hilbert scheme, there's the following theorem due to Grotendieck and Fogarty, in which was explained more in detail by Heimann. The puncture Hilbert scheme is actually a smooth algebraic variety, and it is of dimension 2n. Furthermore, a generic ideal is given by the ideal generated by n distinct points of C2, meaning that taking the ideal generated by n distinct points of C2, this forms an open dense subset of the puncture Hilbert scheme. Since I will use it a lot in the sequel, let us write down explicitly a generic ideal. A generic ideal will have two generators, 
one generator which only uses a polynomial in X, this corresponds to these vertical lines from the example before, and the second generator, which is Y equals some polynomial in X, which corresponds to this Lagrange interpolation polynomial. And as you see, there are two n variables, ti and mu i, which reflects the fact that the function Hilbert scheme is of dimension 2n. Let me give you an idea of the proof of this theorem. How can we cover the Hilbert scheme by charts? Or equivalently, how can we describe in coordinates an arbitrary ideal? We start by the set of all monomials, x to the i, y to the j, which we represent by this quarter of the plane. And we look at these monomials in the quotient c of x, y divided by i. And now we will do something which I will call running in rows. I start at the point 1, and I take the vector, the corresponding vector, in the quotient. And what I will do now is to elaborate the basis of this vector space. My first basis vector will be 1, and then I go along the first row, and as long as the vectors I see, x, x squared, and so on, are linearly independent from the vectors before, I will add them to my basis. At some point, since the vector space is of finite dimension, I will get a vector which is linearly dependent of the vectors before. I mark this by a star. And once I am at the star, I will start in the second row, and so on. I will go through the rows like this. At the end of the process, I will end up with a basis, so a selection of n boxes, which will form a Jung diagram. So it corresponds to the partition of the integer n. And at the end of each row, there will be a star, which corresponds to some relation. Imagine the following example. I am in the first row, and 1x and x squared are linear independent. And the first relation I encounter is x to the 3 equals 2x. Then I go to the second row, and I add to my basis y and xy. And then I encounter another relation, which is y x squared equals 2y. And then I go to the third row, where immediately I will get a new relation, which is y square equals zero. So these three relations give me an ideal. Remark that you cannot have any relations here. Actually, there is some compatibility condition stating that when you take two relations, then there is a common field, a common box here. And when you multiply the relation here by some power of x, and you take the other relation, you multiply it by the power of y, then you should not get a new relation. You should get something which is already generated by the relations given by the stars. In our example, there are two places like this. So when I take the first and the second star, and you look at the intersection, what you get is simply twice y x3 equals 2xy. And when you take the second and the third star, and you multiply in the appropriate way, you will get the relation y squared equals 0, and this we already have in our idea. What we have just seen is that for any ideal, we can get a basis of the quotient c of x, y divided by i, which is actually a mon monomial basis. And these mon monomial basis correspond corresponds to Jung diagrams. So the punctual Hilbert scheme is covered by charts, indexed by Jung diagrams, so by partitions of the integer n. Note that a generic ideal corresponds to the Jung diagram, which is just one row. So you have two generators, one generator of the form x to the n equals some polynomial in x, and the second generator of the form y equals some polynomial in x, which is the Lagrange interpolation polynomial. There is an interesting subspace of the functional Hilbert scheme, which will play a crucial role in the sequel. This is called the zero fiber. So the zero fiber, which we will denote by Hilp m index zero, is the set of ideals which are supported at the origin, meaning that the algebraic variety we see is just the origin. The structure of the zero fiber is given by the following theorem. So it is an irreducible variety of dimension n minus 1, which unfortunately is not smooth. But there is an open dense subset, which is in fact an affine variety, whose ideals are of the following form. You have x to the n, and y equals some polynomial in x without constant term. So you see that you can get a generic ideal in the zero fiber as the limit of n distinct points of the plane, which will continuously collapse to the origin following uh, the Lagrange interpolation polynomial. So you can see it something like as a jet of a curve at the origin. As an example, consider the zero fiber of the two-point Hilbert scheme. In this case, actually, all the ideals are generic, 
and can be written as x square and y equals lambda x for lambda a parameter in CP1, meaning that it can take any value in C and even it can take the value infinity, in which case we have to replace the ideal by y square comma x. So you see that the zero fiber of the two-point Hilbert scheme is nothing but CP1. So you can imagine two particles, one which sits at the origin and another particle which will collapse to the origin and the zero fiber will retain as x for information the direction from which the second particle hits the first one. Let's see how we can define the puncture Hilbert scheme in purely geometric terms. As before, we consider the space of n points in the plane, but in fact we consider them without order. And this is what is called the symmetric space. So the symmetric space of n points of C2 is the quotient of C2 to the n by the symmetric group Sn. Notice that the symmetric space is singular because whenever several points coincide, the action is not free. So one might ask for what is called a resolution of the symmetric space, which means a smooth space which surjects on the symmetric space and which is minimal in some sense. And this resolution is given by the puncture Hilbert scheme. There is a map from the Hilbert scheme to the symmetric space, which is called the Cho map, which is defined as follows. To an ideal I, we associate what is called its support. The support is given by the algebraic variety we see in a set of points, and every point comes with a multiplicity, such that the sum of all the multiplicities gives n. And we consider these points without order. So we get exactly a point in the symmetric space. And then a theorem due to, again, Fogarty and Grotendieck states that this show map is in fact a resolution of singularities, meaning that it is surjective and that it satisfies a certain universal property. So whenever you have a smooth space X and a smooth map to the symmetric space, then it will factor through the Hilbert scheme. In even more geometric terms, one could show that the Hilbert scheme is a successive blow up of the symmetric space. So you can have the following picture in mind. You have the Hilbert scheme and the generic point of the Hilbert scheme corresponds to n distinct points of the plane. And when you move around in the Hilbert scheme, this corresponds to a movement of these n particles. But from time to time, several of these particles will collide. And in this case, the Hilbert scheme will retain as extra information the direction from which the second particle hits the first one. Up to now, we have seen two of the three possible definitions. We have seen the puncture Hilbert scheme as a space of ideals and as the blow up of the symmetric space. And we know how to go from one to each other, from the symmetric space. We can go to the Hilbert scheme just by viewing n points as an algebraic variety. So you take the ideal defining u points. And you can go from the algebraic viewpoint to the symmetric space via the Cho map. Let's see how we can describe the puncture Hilbert scheme as a space of commuting matrices. Let's take an ideal i in the Hilbert scheme. So we know that the quotient c of x, y divided by i is a vector space of dimension n. And in this vector space, I will consider two operators, mx and my, which are the multiplication operators by x and by y. So this gives me two matrices of size n, which commute, since the multiplication by x and by y commutes, and which have the following property. So they admit what is called a cyclic vector. This means there's a vector, which in our case, we can choose, for example, the vector given by one, the image by one in the quotient, and from this vector, we can generate the whole vector space just by applying the two matrices, mx and my, maybe several times. In fact, the space of pairs of matrices with these properties is nearly the whole puncture Hilbert scheme. So we have the following proposition. The endpoint Hilbert scheme is given by pairs of matrices, which commute, which admit a cyclic vector, and all this quotient out by the action of GLN by conjugation. In order to show this proposition, it is sufficient actually to give you the inverse direction. How can I define an ideal from a pair of commuting matrices? So when I take two matrices A and B which commute, I can associate the set of all polynomials P such that P of AB equals zero. So this is well defined since A and B commute. This always gives an ideal. And the fact that A and B admits a cyclic vector assures that it will be an ideal of codimension N. 
Notice that in this matrix viewpoint, the zero fiber is just given by pairs of matrices which commute and which are nilpotent. In the sequel, this matrix viewpoint will be very important. So we can ask the following question, what becomes the generic ideal in this matrix viewpoint? So remember that a generic ideal is given by a polynomial in X and the Lagrange interpolation polynomial. In the case of this generic ideal, I can give you a basis, a monomial basis of the quotient, C of xy divided by i, given by 1, x, x squared, and so on, until x to the n minus 1. This corresponds to a Jung diagram, which is just one row. In this basis, I can now write the multiplication operator of x, mx. And so mx will become a matrix which is called a companion matrix. So you have ones just under the diagonal, and you have a non-trivial last column, where we see actually the ti coordinates. So this last column corresponds exactly to the relation xn equals sum of ti x to the n minus i. For the second matrix, we can observe the following. So the second matrix is the multiplication operator by y, and y is given by q of x, some polynomial in x. And this means actually that the multiplication operator my is given by q of mx, polynomial of the matrix mx. I can write it as mu1 times the identity plus mu2 times mx plus and so on plus mu n mx to the n minus 1. And in order to give you a feeling on how such a matrix looks like, here are the three first columns. So actually in the first column you see the mu i coordinates, the coefficients of the Lagrange interpolation polynomial, and all the other coefficients in this matrix are explicit functions of mu i and ti. So we have seen the link between the space of ideals and uh, the space of commuting matrices, but it is also possible to directly see the link between the symmetric space, space of endpoints, and the space of matrices. So whenever I have two commuting matrices, I can simultaneously trigonalize them, meaning that I can put them in upper triangular form simultaneously. When I write these two matrices in this upper triangular form, I will just take the pairs of points on the diagonal as coordinates of n points of the plane. Notice that the writing of the matrices in upper triangular form is unique up to permutation, which means that I get n points of the plane up to permutation, which is precisely a point in this matrix space. And conversely, for n distinct points of the plane, so a generic point in this matrix space, I can associate two matrices, which are diagonal, with the coordinates, the x and the y coordinates on the diagonal. So now we have completed the cycle of ideas of the picture at the beginning. We now have three viewpoints and we can go from any viewpoint to any other. Let's see one more aspect of the puncture Hilbert scheme, which is its symplectic structure. In fact, the puncture Hilbert scheme inherits a complex symplectic structure coming from C2. On the space of n distinct points of the plane, C2 to the n, you have a symplectic form given by omega equals the sum of dxi wedge dyi. So x and y here are complex coordinates. And I claim that this form will descend to the puncture Hilbert scheme. In order to show this, let's see how we can express omega in the coordinates of the big chart, the chart given by t and mu, the chart of the generic ideals. First notice that we can write omega as the trace of dmx wedge dmy, where mx and my are diagonal matrices with entries xi and yi. These two matrices are precisely the matrices we associate to n distinct points of the plane. And we have seen in the matrix viewpoint that actually we can conjugate them to the matrices of the form mx is a companion matrix, and the second matrix my is conjugated to a quite complicated matrix where in the first column you see the mu's, and each other entry, which we call here alpha ij, is given by an explicit function of the mu's and the t's. Since the trace is invariant under conjugation, you can use these matrices for mx and my. But then dmx is zero everywhere apart from the last column. So you see that omega just becomes the sum of dti wedge d alpha n comma n plus one minus i. So we have written the symplectic form in our coordinates mu and t. Notice that you can express omega in any other chart given by a Jung diagram. This can be found in Heimann's paper. Now that we have the symplectic form, we can notice that on the locus of the zero fiber, omega becomes zero. 
because on the zero fiber, all the t's are zero, so the omega also becomes zero. But nevertheless, the zero fiber is not the Lagrangian subspace because it is of dimension n minus one, and the functional Hilbert scheme is of dimension two n. But we can solve this problem by defining what is called the reduced Hilbert scheme. So the reduced Hilbert scheme is defined to be those points of the symmetric space whose very center is the origin. In our matrix viewpoint, this means that the matrices A and B are not any matrices anymore, but they will be in SLM, which means of trace zero. In our coordinates of the big chart, given by the Ti and the mu i, we will get that T1 becomes zero, because actually T1 is the sum of the xi, so the sum of the x coordinates of the n points, and this is n times the coordinate of the Bari center, which now is zero. And we will get that mu1, the constant term of the Lagrange interpolation polynomial, will become an explicit function of the other variables. So you can imagine a curve, the Lagrange interpolation polynomial, you have n points on this curve. You compute the Barry center, which will lie somewhere on the y-axis, and then you have to, to shift the whole picture such that the Barry center becomes the origin. And this shift corresponds to the mu1, to the constant term. And now we have the following proposition. The reduced Hilbert scheme is still a smooth algebraic variety, which is symplectic, so it inherits the symplectic structure of the total functional Hilbert scheme, and the zero fiber is a Lagrangian subspace of the reduced Hilbert scheme. To finish, let's give some further ideas, some further developments, what you can do with the functional Hilbert scheme. First of all, the functional Hilbert scheme inherits from C2 not only a complex symplectic structure, but an even stronger geometric structure, which is the hyperkähler structure. Second, one can consider puncture Hilbert schemes not only for C2, but for any complex variety. In particular, the puncture Hilbert schemes of K3 surfaces play an important role in hyperkähler geometry. Finally, let us remark that we can generalize the matrix viewpoint and define something which I call the Hilbert scheme associated to a Lie algebra G. So the Lie algebra has to be complex and semi-simple. And the definition goes as follows. So the Hilbert scheme associated to the Lie algebra is given by pairs of elements of the Lie algebra, which commute, which satisfy an analog of the cyclic vector, which is given by the condition that the dimension of the common centralizer is equal to the rank of the Lie algebra. And to quotient this whole set by the adjoint action of the group G. In a recent paper, I explored the generalization of the Hilbert scheme to a Lie algebra. Now that we have understood in detail the functional Hilbert scheme, we are ready to construct the higher complex structure. This will be the subject of my second talk. Thanks for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. Feel free to ask your questions in comments. And if you speak French, have a look on my other YouTube channel where I explain mathematical subjects which are more basic. See you next time. Thank you.